So good afternoon. Uh, a warm welcome from my side. I'm Sylvia Schmidt. Uh, I work for IFOM Organics Europe, the European Association for Organic Food and Farming. And I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating today this webinar about scaling up and out, um, and specifically about building short supply chains for the local food economies. So I'll do, I'll get it out the, I'll get the housekeeping rules uh, out of the way so that we can then go really delve into the topic of today uh, right afterwards. So the direct questions to the speakers, we really encourage you to ask all the questions you may have also during the presentation, um, but please write your questions by using the Q&A box uh, and not the chat box. So the chat box should really be more for uh, general remarks for technical issues, and you um, can be reassured that uh, a few members of Food Shift will be on the other side of the chat box and will be supporting you uh, for any technical issue you may have. And actually, we really encourage you to use the chat box also to um, say hello, to update us on uh, any projects that you may be working on and that um, are pertinent for today's webinar. Uh, and just try to mimic uh, as if it were, you know, real life that we can actually uh, talk to each other and, and uh, network a bit more. Um, so please do not use the raise hand function to ask questions and just really ask the questions in the Q&A box. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the speaker's presentation and we'll really try to answer all the questions you've asked. Uh, just for you to know, this webinar is being recorded and we will post it on the Food Shift website next week, um, as well as email all of you to um, let you know that the webinar is on the website and also to share any other resources that, were, that will be mentioned today. And finally, last but absolutely not least, let me thank you, thank in advance our two interpreters, Claudia and Ruxandra. Uh, they will be interpreting uh, the speakers from English into Romanian, so all the speakers will be speaking in English, but should you want to follow the webinar in Romanian, you can do so. You uh, go in the interpretation button and you just choose the language. Please just remember also if you want to uh, follow the webinar in English, choose English. If in Romanian, choose Romanian. Um, and again, if you have any technical problems, just write it in the chat and our team will be there to support you. So now let's go over a bit of what we will be doing today in terms of the agenda. Uh, so after the housekeeping rules, I will shortly give the floor to Christian Brugge Hendrickson. He is the food shift coordinator. He will also welcome you uh, from his side. Then I will be giving you my two cents on this topic. Uh, then we will be hearing from our speakers. So uh, we have Raluca Barbu from High Care Consulting in Brazov, Romania. We will be hearing also from Tom Unak from Ampi in the Czech Republic. And finally, we'll be hearing from Nick Ver of the Open Food Network. And after all of this, we will be addressing your questions. Um, so we already thank you for your active participation in a Q&A session. And then of course, a short wrap up. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor, the virtual floor to Christian. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sylvia. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, welcome uh, all of you also here to the last uh, Food Shift uh, webinar in uh, 2021. We've already had a number of uh, webinars uh, this year and we will uh, for sure continue next year as well. In the Food Shift uh, 2030 project that uh, I'm coordinating, we are working on uh, citizen-driven innovation to support a sustainable transformation of the European food system. And uh, as an integrated part of the project, we are focusing also on developing a more localized food system as an alternative to the dominating uh, globalized uh, food system. So uh, COVID-19 and, and climate change may cause disruptions uh, to this uh, global food system. And uh, that has also showed us that a more uh, balanced food system with more uh, food uh, sourced locally and regionally uh, is necessary in order to make the food system more uh, resilient uh, to future challenges. So uh, therefore I'm very much looking forward to hear from the uh, speakers today uh, on examples on, on how shorter supply chains
can help uh, strength uh, local food systems and uh, local uh, economies. So uh, with these words, uh, over to you again, uh, Sylvia. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Christian. So indeed, we have heard that today will be about building short supply chains for uh, local food economies and where we intend short supply chains as a way to connect local suppliers with local consumers more directly compared to um, conventional and perhaps more, well, not perhaps, more complex uh, supply chains that we have uh, even gotten used to in the past few years also due to globalization. So this webinar definitely comes at a very timely moment. Um, you probably have all heard of the farm to fork strategy, um, which is this communication of the European Commission to transition holistically towards more sustainable food systems. And this farm to fork strategy acknowledges that the calls for shorter supply chains intensified during the uh, outbreak, the, the, the coronavirus virus outbreak, of course, um, and the Commission um, commits to enhancing resilience of regional and local food systems by creating shorter supply chains. And how do they aim to do that? By reducing dependence on long haul transportation. So we do not have any, any details as to you know, the specifics, but already knowing that short supply chains are uh, on the political agenda and are mentioned in the farm to fork strategy uh, is definitely a step forward. So the interest in local foods is a well-established trend. It's a research trend. And we see that factors like health consciousness, like concern for the environment and concern for the local uh, economy are a significant predictor of attitude towards buying more local foods uh, and interest in uh, short food supply chains. So we know that this interest was already present prior to the COVID pandemic, but we have seen that with the COVID pandemic, uh, consumers have changed some of their attitudes towards food. So I come from the organic world and we have definitely seen in 2020, really sales of organic products going uh, through the roof. And also just as a consumer, I wanted to um, subscribe to a local box scheme, but they were none of them was available. There was a very long waiting list. So we really saw and we really see this consumer interest towards um, more sustainable, healthier uh, foods. So I want to end my short intervention with uh, two data points that I found interesting. And the first one comes from a study of the European Commission that was conducted in the summer of last year. So really in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, we could still say that we're now in the midst of the pandemic, but that's, you know, aside. So the respondents were asked to uh, say what for them was a healthy and a sustainable diet. And almost half of respondents replied that for them, it was about eating seasonal, about eating local foods. And about a third of them replied that it was about eating organic foods. And while it is not, at least I couldn't really find data about, you know, before the pandemic and after the pandemic, how consumer attitudes changed toward shorter supply chain, I did find that in France, about 29% of consumers said that they buy more local foods after the first two months of quarantine. So these are interesting trends and hopefully it will continue this way. Um, hopefully they're here to stay and of course only time will tell. But for now, what we'll do today is hear about three different ways of making short supply chains work in three different contexts. So without further ado, I'd really like to introduce again, so our first speaker, we have Raluca Barbu from High Clear Consulting in Brazov, Romania. Raluca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Silvia. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna request the control then. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Raluca Barbu. I'm from High Clear Consulting in Romania, partner in um, a food shift um, project. Um, 
because time is very short, I'm going to be um, speaking very fast. Please um, interrupt me if it's, um, if you have questions um, or something is not clear. Uh, just very briefly, our experience with uh, with the concept of short supply chain uh, started um, actually uh, in early 2000. Uh, 2004 with uh, working in um, uh, direct connection with uh, with the small farmers um, and became more concrete um, with our involvement in the rural development strategy for the current programming period which is coming to to an end uh, this year um, um, also, personally, I got involved with coordination of the first working group on short supply chain under the measure cooperation. I have to tell you that short supply chain was right at the beginning as a concept and it uh, requested lots of clarifications at the both institutional level and among farmers and other stakeholders. Um, a couple of years later, the measure had uh, tremendous success. Um, it had uh, lots of uh, funds um, um, attracted by uh, partnerships um, set up under this uh, this measure short supply chain uh, for the first time in Romania. Um, why it is important this uh, concept for for uh, Romania is because uh, over ninety percent of the farmers and uh, uh, in Romania, they are less, uh, they are managing less than five hectares uh, due to uh, farmland fragmentation. And most of it is exp uh, extensive, uh, under extensive farming practices, meaning that also uh, generates uh, small quantities of products most of the time, or uh, has to be put together with other, with other um, products of uh, different farms. Uh, food safety and hygiene standards have been um, uh, kept high at high uh, uh, level for for these uh, small farmers, meaning that uh, sometimes uh, their understanding of uh, what it means to access the market and to sell the market, and particularly in in direct uh, sales, um, um, took some time to be clarified. And they are still sometimes a bottleneck for the small producers to to get on the market. Um, also, the low access to capital it took some time for, for the farmers to become small producers and to um, get into direct sales and to get connected directly with, with consumers. Until then, it, there were more informal uh, networks of, uh, of uh, short supply chain, so not so professionalized. But in the last um, in the last years, this is becoming uh, uh, much more official, let's say, and legal, and re uh, recognized by both producers and consumers as um, a very effective way of uh, of um, uh, supplying each other, but also to stay connected directly. Um, because the uh, communities of uh, farmers are very important um, for us in Romania because. Um, you, you know, it takes a, it takes a whole village to to grow a child, but to grow a community of small farmers takes uh, takes uh, uh, as well um, the whole community. Um, we were looking also at the dynamics of uh, within the communities of small farmers, um, and we came to understand that the welfare of uh, farmers and small producers depend very much on the welfare of their communities. So this was a very important element to to consider when uh, when uh, analyzing short supply chain in Romania. Um, association of uh, producers is at the beginning, uh, is still on the progress, and um, to educate consumers, as um, also Sylvia mentioned, as you mentioned Sylvia um, earlier. Um, um, it takes a little bit of, uh, of time. Yes, the pandemic has accelerated the uh, adoption of uh, more local products, um, but some of them, they are only now realizing that they've been under the mirage of perfect uh, fruits and vegetables as they um, 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 started to confess, actually, that uh, they are coming to understand that um, um, judging a fruit or a vegetable or a product just uh, uh, based on the appearance is not everything anymore and they are looking very much for real taste and for connecting with the taste that they used to know in their childhood. Um, last but uh, not least is um, uh, reviving the um, local gastronomy. 
and um, we are looking at chefs um, as real agent for change, um, meaning that they have the um, they are like an interface and they can encourage and educate uh, consumers to adopt more uh, local menus and to adopt local products and to consider their uh, relationship with the producers in a more direct uh, uh, way. Uh, that's why in, um, in uh, food shift, in um, the goal for our uh, food acceleration of uh, lab is to integrate traditional, predominantly small scale and local producers into innovative and ambitious regional food system, fostering a more localized food economy and reviving the gastronomic uh, heritage of the area. Um, we are a partnership of uh, three local partners. It's us, High Clear Consulting. Um, it's um, the um, agency of Mon metropolitan uh, area of uh, Brasov and Iceberg uh, Plus. Uh, these are the um, producers or the daughter of uh, one of the producers we are working with and um, uh, the landscapes uh, from the area, but also the chefs that we are directly uh, working in, uh, in uh, food shift. Um, and that's why we structured our intervention um, in the lab um, on um, local food processing innovation, innovation in, in public policies, where we are also trying to uh, bring the local producers and local products uh, directly um, uh, with um, public procurement, um, but also innovation in marketing and supply chain to see what kind of um, uh, tools for shortening the distances we can, uh, we can put together. I'm not going to assist on this. These are the um, initiatives and the so-called innovations in the project that we, we are focusing and which are touching directly on short supply chain. Um, is uh, working with a cooperative of small farmers, <clears throat> fair soil, because uh, um, aggregation of small producers and uh, uh, local products is still a, um, a challenge. Um, they are not so used to work together and making the shift, making the transition from those informal networks uh, for selling to become more professionalized and to become more um, uh, official on the market, uh, it takes it takes quite some time. Um, uh, also, as I mentioned, it's about working with um, developing actually a whole scheme and criteria for local menus. Um, and we know very well that restaurants during this pandemic have been under a lot of um, uh, pressure and challenge. Um, we wanted them not to start compromising on the ingredients, so to still adopt and use very much and promote local ingredients um, and buy that local products uh, and producers as well. It's also um, an initiative that is very dear to me is the promotion of a chain of gastronomic points, which is touching exactly what I mentioned before about the communities of, uh, of uh, small producers, because it's uh, very much about, um, it's about serving food from the farm um, um, to the tourists and people who want to try and uh, to experiment local taste. Um, we are looking very much also about how to add value, as you also mentioned um, about the organic uh, farming, organic agriculture, but also uh, mountain products because we are in a mountain area and it's very much about how to add values to the products which are uh, uh, sell through a short supply chain and how to uh, better promote and increase the adoption and um, um, uh, from, from a consumer side as well. Um, and um, it's also very much about an ongoing working with producers to become more professionalized. Um, we encountered um, <laughs> Uh, sometimes uh, things were moving too fast and they said, uh, I don't know how to deal with, uh, with uh, uh, the bank, uh, you know, uh, cancelling my uh, uh, account because I haven't uh, submitted my fiscal declarations as a producer. So we are sometimes uh, tempted to push for things a little bit too much and forget or neglect the small stuff which are actually encountered by producers, for instance. Um, so it's an ongoing process that we, we are trying to see how um, small producers can become more efficient, more adapted and more professionalized when activating in short supply chain. Um, 
as I said, this is the um, uh, one of the um, example the co-op um, uh, that has been activated, and during the summer they connected directly. So the short supply chain work directly under um, um, testing our testing in the summer. Uh, with the support of the municipality, we accessed the um, free market, which was not functional for quite a few years. And um, uh, the local um, producers had the chance to connect directly with uh, consumers. It was a very interesting um, experience that we hope to continue next year because uh, consumers were very curious to learn about the producer, about the products directly from them. And the um, number of families that uh, actually uh, started to come uh, regularly to the market um, uh, increased in just a couple of weeks uh, from uh, 5 to 25. So on a regular basis, they were coming to the free market um, every week to meet the producers and to buy their products. Um, as I mentioned also about the, the chain of local gastronomic points, um, um, it's very much about um, <clears throat> promoting the communities of uh, small producers, but also to communicate the local uh, taste, the local ingredients, and it's very much connected with, uh, with tourism uh, uh, activities, um, attracting uh, um, tourists to come not just for visiting the area, but also to, to feel the taste and uh, to buy directly uh, products from, uh, from the farm. Um, and we also had very nice experience with um, a couple of sessions with uh, young consumers who declared that they would like to know more. They would like to buy more from local producers. They find sometimes difficult to access them. They find sometimes that they are a little bit more expensive for, for, for their income, that supermarkets unfortunately still remain uh, most accessible and by hand uh, way of, uh, for them for procuring their food. Um, so we, we took quite some notes from, from them. Um, my last uh, slide is very much about uh, challenge and opportunities in working with the uh, uh, short supply chain. I think it's very much about, we should, as a first challenge, I think it's very much about the identifying the real needs. Why we want to have um, a short supply chain, um, how is one end communicating to another, what are the needs of both uh, involve and what we have in the middle, if it is uh, anything in the middle and how to communicate what is in the middle, because sometimes, for instance, uh, we might need a storage place, uh, we need to communicate and to be transparent to the, to the consumers. It's also very much about uh, ensuring quantities and volumes uh, to be consistent. Sometimes uh, consumers are looking for seasonal products, but sometimes they would like to know why they cannot find uh, the, those products all year long. So it is an ongoing uh, education. Uh, it's about um, innovation. It's about adopting um, more technologies and apps to, to shorten these uh, distances and to help communication between the two ends. It's building trust, which takes time. Um, and then not the last uh, guidance through the, uh, through the change. It's um, being there all the time to, to communicate, to assist, to guide. Uh, as opportunities, I think um, association and aggregation of uh, small producers is uh, it's, uh, coming much better. Um, also professionalization, they want and they come to understand that it's necessary. It's about adding value and we have schemes now more recognized and adopted and promoted and um, not to, to mention funds as well. Um, um, connecting uh, connection to consumers is not so difficult to do um, by, uh, by uh, farmers and uh, producers. And um, uh, last but not least is uh, cooperation. And I think we are exploring much more the cooperation in different directions within the, the food chain. Um, yes, that's it from me. Sorry if I, I think I took a little bit more. Yes, thank you, Raluca. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, I really like that you mentioned the important role of education, both of farmers, of consumers, you know, citizens in general. Uh, that that's really quite crucial, and I hope we'll come back to that in the Q and A discussion as well. Uh, and also, I like that you mentioned the you know public procurement, and at least at EU level, we also see public procurement as a um, crucial way of um, changing the demand and therefore also changing the production towards a more sustainable um, production. 
But so, uh, without further ado, I would like to now give the floor to our second speaker. Uh, we have Tom Unak from AMPI, uh, and AMPI is the Association of Local Food Initiatives in the Czech Republic. So, Tom, uh, the, the virtual floor is now yours. Hello, Sylvia. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this webinar. Very happy to be uh, together with all of you, at least virtually. I will share my screen with you. Okay. Can you see my presentation now? Very well, indeed. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So, as Sylvia mentioned, I uh, come from Association of Local Food Initi Initiatives in the Czech Republic. And I will be talking to you about, uh, I, will do, I will do a follow-up on Raluca in terms of, uh, I will take you through a microcosm of a uh, localized food system. Uh, specifically about the community supported agriculture in the Czech Republic. So what are the, primarily for those who uh, don't know about uh, CSA, uh, what are the key principles? So uh, first of all, it's a direct partnership between organic farmers and a group of consumers who are called shell shareholders. Uh, there are no other intermediaries. Uh, we are sharing the risks with uh, the farmers. And this is uh, at least, I see it as a paradigm changing uh, uh, in terms of uh, how consumers are sharing risk uh, with the farmers uh, in a crop failure, for example. And I will talk about this later. Uh, we are supporting local solidarity economy. Uh, uh, the CSA principles are based on mutual trust, ecology and food sovereignty which was defined by uh, the movement La Via Campesina by, uh, as the right of peoples to a healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. So we are trying to define and shape our own food and agriculture system through CSA. And it, this model allows us to do so. Um, Short introduction on the context of CSAs in Czech Republic. Uh, it has taken its roots in uh, around the year 2008. Up until today, uh, we have around 80 collection points slash community gardens all across Czech Republic. And uh, there are more than 3,000 shareholders involved, uh, but um, we have to, uh, multiply this number by at least two or three because these uh, each shareholder represents a family so we are feeding basically uh, whole families with this model and there are around 30 farmers involved in this model uh, what i'd like to show you now quickly is uh, something that we developed uh, this is a you know, map of Europe and Czech Republic. I'm sure everybody knows where Czech Republic is. And uh, this is what we came up with uh, when, in collaboration with the Friends of the Earth, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, I will now filter only the CSAs existing. These are the existing uh, CSA in Czech Republic. So you can see how, uh, of course, they are concentrated in Prague, but also in the rural areas. Uh, there, are, if you click uh, on them, you can you can see uh, the details and and this is a very important uh, point. We have also option for farmers. So these are only farmers looking for CSA. Uh, farmers looking to become part of a CSA and consumer groups uh, that are looking for a farmer. So this way, this is a very uh, useful tool to connect consumer groups and farmers uh, together. I will go now back to my presentation. Uh, very shortly, case study of uh, 
our <laughs> short introduction into the CSA where I'm a coordinator. It's called CSA Smetanka, translated as uh, CSA uh, Cream, uh, named after uh, one uh, community garden. Um, there are 40 shareholders, uh, again, uh, we have to divide this, uh, sorry, multiply this by three or four. So let's say 100 or 20 people uh, are being fed through this model. Uh, we have one uh, distribution point. We get biweekly deliveries of fresh vegetables from May to December. And we have special, and this is for the, this is the first year we are also trying um, uh, winter deliveries, so winter uh, CSA model. And we have uh, three partnerships with producers of vegetables, eggs, and goat cheese. And then we have also seasonal or, or occasional partnerships with uh, other uh, producers, meat producers, uh, fruit producers, etc. Uh, these are our farmers, Vojta and Zuska, with their uh, new, uh, with their firstborn son. Uh, this is how it looks like when we get the delivery. So the farmer uh, drives it uh, from his farm to our delivery point, and then it's up to us. And this is how we save time and money to the farmers that we uh, redistribute it amongst ourselves. So there's always a, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, well, people for, or shareholders who uh, are uh, redistributing the produce. So it's not the box scheme, uh, as you might know it. This, this, uh, we are saving time for the farmers, to the farmers, uh, so that we kind of, uh, you know, measure it ourselves, etc. We get very, very broad uh, varieties of vegetables, uh, up to 15 to 20 kinds or types of vegetables in kilos, could be around 10 to 15 kilos per one uh, delivery. We are also trying to uh, support our farmers uh, and also get to know the reality of the farmers by visiting them, uh, helping them with uh, either harvest or preparing uh, the uh, preparing the, the season in the beginning of the year. And the, of course, it has a uh, very strong educational quality to it as well. Uh, we understand better how the food is grown, where it's grown, and uh, what does it actually mean to grow or organic organically. So, you know, for most of us, it's uh, or for most of the people, it's probably abstract. Uh, what does it really mean to grow without any pesticides and chemicals? So uh, what I would like to mention is that this year, after many, many years of uh, discussions, we decided to form a national CSA coalition because there are already quite a few communities, CSA communities, and we felt like we wanted to team up and create something that kind of uh, goes beyond our individual approach. And uh, we aim to uh, identify the key uh, elements that we uh, wish to uh, preserve. And also uh, one of the functions of these meetings of the coalition, CSA coalition meetings is uh, that we hear from the farmers, we invite them to these meetings to, uh, we ask them to share their experiences, their reality, their problems with us. And we try to solve these problems or challenges together. And of course, we are trying to help uh, other new uh, communities to set up their uh, uh, CSA models. Uh, I'd like to close with uh, opportunities and challenges as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the solidarity approach and sharing risks uh, in times of crop failure, for example, is a very, very significant aspect. This happened to us uh, last year with uh, heavy rains and um, basically half of the crops uh, got rotten and uh, we shared the risk. So we didn't want uh, the money in return. 
uh, we didn't want the money that we invested in. Uh, we left it with the farmer because uh, this was uh, uh, the farmer's uh, kind of only income. So we didn't want to take away the income from them. And we understand that they need to live as well, uh, even though they don't have anything to sell or uh, not much. Of course, this, this wasn't for the whole season. This was occasional uh, problems. Um, another aspect we are considering is integration of low income groups. And we are discussing models, how to, uh, how to really integrate people, especially in these times of COVID-19, uh, people who prioritize other uh, things like, you know, for example, uh, you know, a heated room uh, instead of a, a good quality food. So we are trying to uh, um, uh, come up with models, how to, uh, how to integrate uh, these parts of our communities. And lastly, and this was mentioned already, uh, we believe that in order to address larger population, you know, CSA model will never become the major model. Uh, we need diversity of ecological short distribution chain models. And we see a, a, a significant potential and systemic solution in green public, public procurement which could be pretty much uh, inspired by some of the CSA principles. So with this, I'd like to thank you again and uh, handing uh, the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, that was really interesting. And I think we can really all agree of how impressive that map was. Um, and really nice to see how really farmers, um, where farmers are and which consumers are looking for farmers. Um, I see that some in the, in the Q&A have, have more questions about uh, this tool, so perhaps we'll get back to it uh, later on. Um, before we go to our next speaker, let me just remind you that in order to ask questions to our speakers, you should use the Q&A box. We are looking forward to all your questions. And now on to our last speaker for today. Uh, Nick Veer of the Open Food Network. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sylvia. And hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here and to be with you. Wait, uh, Nick, sorry if I interrupt you. The, the sound is really not good. I'm not sure how to describe it. Could you try again, perhaps? Turn, if, I will turn off my video, see if that makes it any better. Is no, that it's better really as if the, the mic, it's as if the mic had a problem. Yeah. That's a pity. Of course, it worked well in the reversal. Yeah. It and worked fine. Now, yeah. Is it? Is that any No, better? it's still it's still really quite bad. Okay. I'm going to try to move to a different place. That's great. I don't know what you did there. It was a lot better. Okay. Is that better now? That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. I will try to still on one video. And is it okay even with video? Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah, it was oh. just a, a micro sound. Thank Fine. you very much. So, Good. go on, the okay. floor is yours. Okay, <laughs> apologies, everybody. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you to the previous speakers. Uh, Tom, I'm really pleased to hear about CSA. Um, I'm a part time grower on a CSA in the UK and um, I completely support your principles and your, and your projects. Um, my Presentation is about the Open Food Network. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you the, the global community of the Open Food Network. Um, it is a global community of farmers, growers, community food enterprises, and software geeks. Um, what brings us together is a common passion and a common belief that the food systems of the world are broken. The mainstream food systems are broken, and we need to rebuild those food systems from the bottom up. Uh, one of the tools we provide to support communities in rebuilding food systems is an open source, not-for-profit um, platform. It was developed originally in Australia 10 years ago. Uh, we brought it to the UK eight years ago. It's now in 20 countries with another 15 countries in the process of, of deploying the software. Um, this is what it looks like in the UK. Um, I, we've had a, we've, yeah, this is a map of the Open Food Network in the UK. Many of these are CSAs. Um, you can see there's tractor symbols here. These are people who are producing food and there's also shop symbols. The shops in some cases may be farms. They may be farmers and growers who are selling direct from the farm or they may be food hubs. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about food hubs in a moment. 
there are many, many different forms of food hubs. Some of them are farmers markets, traditional farmers markets, but with an online shop front using the Open Food Network to take pre-orders for a market. Um, the shoppers pre-order, the produce is brought to the market. Um, it may be that producers who aren't physically at the market would like to sell online and they can also sell online and have their produce brought to the market. The produce is then boxed up and then people either come to the market to pick up pre-ordered boxes or the farmers are going back with empty vans and trucks. They can take those pre-ordered boxes back to their, to their farms and then those can be pickup points from, um, from which local people can pick up from uh, villages and towns around the main market. This extend, extends the geographical reach of the market and reduces the carbon, the carbon footprint in terms of food miles. Um, many of these shops in the UK, there's about 150 of them buried in this map here. Uh, some of those shops are food banks distributing surplus food. I see there's been quite a few questions about um, addressing food poverty, trying to build food equality. I can talk a bit more later about, about how some of those projects are working. Some are purely distributing surplus food. Some are community projects where people who can afford to pay for full price, those who are going to pay more than full price actually pay forward. There's this lovely concept of buying a veg box for a neighbour that you have never met. <laughs> People in your area who need it and the food hub building up a bursary, building up a fund to enable people who are on lower incomes to access high quality food. Um, what I'd like to do is now take you to my hometown, which is down here uh, in, in the southwest of the UK. Um, the Open Food Network is very much in the background behind the project. The shoppers and the buyers see when they come to the Open Food Network. They don't see the Open Food Network branding, they see the local branding. I live in Stroud in, in Gloucestershire in southwest UK. This is our map, uh, this, sorry, this is our website, this is our um, WordPress website. Lots of detail about how we, how we run our food hub. But if you click on the shop symbol here, it takes you the, the shop tab, bigger pardon, it takes you into the eco page Open Food Network. So you see the Open Food Network branding here. Um, this is our the link to the shop. We choose to land people at a notices page because there's a lot of information people need, particularly around the pandemic in terms of how they how they collect their food. But the, the shop tab takes you to the, the producers. Um, we can see there are 85 different producers selling through this um, through this food hub. We are bringing together a range of, of producers across the board. Some of them are CSAs, producing vegetables, some are meat producers. Uh, you can see we've got uh, all these different categories of food um, represented on the, on the right hand side. And the shoppers can filter on what we call properties. So if they're only interested in certified organic produce, they can do they can filter there. If they want plastic free, if they want vegan, if they want only very local food, then they, they can filter. So if we have a look at the meat, apologies to any vegans in the in the audience, um, we can see a picture of the produce. Every producer puts up a description of their produce. Uh, this isn't a particularly detailed description. We encourage the producers to give lots of detail about the product and how it's produced. And we're very much into transparency. The Open Food Network wants to build not only short food supply chains, but transparent food supply chains. So the Food Hub uh, encourages all producers to put up details about their, themselves. And as well as seeing details of the product, you can actually click here and see who is this producer. He introduces himself, he gives a lot of detail about his farming and his, his butchering techniques. He puts up his phone number, his website, his email address, his social media links, so that we can build connections between the people growing the food and the people eating it. Um, the other point about transparency is that the producer will set the selling price for their product and then the hub, the distributor, will make a markup. They will add a, a percentage to that selling price. And the shopper can see that. They can see exactly how much of the final selling price that they're paying is going to go to the producer and how much will be retained by, by the hub. Um, it's a standard e-commerce platform. Um, you simply add products to your basket um, and then when you check out, uh, you have options to, um, to have different shipping methods at checkout. So, um, this, this particular food hub has, has options to pick up from the pickup point, um, 
There's also a home delivery service where the shopper can pay a little bit extra and have the produce delivered either by cycle courier or by or by by car. Um, and there's also different payment methods. Uh, this particular hub is only taking credit and debit cards. There are options to pay by bank transfer or PayPal or cash or check or whatever. Um, so that's the, the, the front end for the shopper. Uh, let me take you briefly to, to some of the details here in terms of the administration. I mentioned earlier that the producers are setting their selling prices. They will set up their, their products here. Um, if there's a large product range that can be imported, um, the hub will set up an order cycle, a period during which a shopper or a buyer can, can place an order. Um, all the orders can be monitored and, and uh, considered as they come in. Lots of reports. You can imagine with 85 different producers and a product range of about 2,000 products, we need to know in a lot of detail exactly which products are being delivered and we need to know which shoppers have ordered which produce. So we have a series of different reports so that the pickers and the packers can then prepare the boxes and the bags ready to go out to the shoppers and the buyers. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. This software is designed and developed. As I mentioned earlier, it's open source. It's owned by the people who are using the software. And they are the people who, over the last 10 years, have been saying, I'm running a CSA. I need this report. I'm running a food bank. I need to know. I need to link with my accounting system. I'm running a, uh, a shop direct from my farm. I need to know what my cropping, cropping uh, schedule is for this week. And so we've developed this software and we continue to evolve this software to meet the needs of the people who are using it. We have a new release of the software every Tuesday. So the software is evolving on a weekly basis. And there are people all over the world who are contributing to the, to the code base, which is a common code base. We um, have nine core principles. Um, as I mentioned, we're open source. Uh, this is the global website that I'm looking at now. And these are the nine core values that, that, we, um, that we hold to. And uh, I'm currently working, uh, I'm actually calling from Portugal, even though I'm based in the UK, because I'm uh, working currently with all of the different European countries who are using the Open Food Network to develop a, an Open Food Network Europe, which will be an umbrella organization that will bring together all of the European countries to look at what are the common issues in terms of short food supply chains across Europe and how can we share best practice? So it may be that a food hub in Germany has evolved a new way of distributing chilled or frozen produce. And that information is, is really useful to somebody in Italy who's using the same software and wants to, wants to to, to learn from, from a community of practice. The other thing I want to mention is that the Open Food Network, as far as I know, is the only global open food, sorry, the only global open source platform. There are many, many platforms that offer an e-commerce service to build short food supply chains, but most of them are proprietary. They are owned and controlled by somebody who has set up the software in the first place. We believe that if we're gonna rebuild a food system, it will a new system with different tools than the tools that we use to build the current system. And the, the current system is built on ownership and control. And we believe that if we need to rebuild, we need to build with tools that are in common ownership. Having said that, there are some incredibly good software tools out there, proprietary software tools that do things that the Open Food Network doesn't do. So in the last few months, we've been working on an interoperability project. It was piloted in France last year. Um, in France, the Open Food Network set up something called the Data Food Consortium, which brings together many online platforms and develops a single data standard so that producers, farmers, growers, community food enterprises can set up on one platform and their data can then be operable, interoperable with other platforms. So that if a farmer wants to sell produce on multiple platforms, they can easily do that with a common data standard. And I'm happy to talk more about that later. I think I've taken my time. Um, I'm very happy to take more questions as we go through, but uh, thank you for your time. And I will stop my screen share. Back to you, Sylvia. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, that was also a very impressive map and a very impressive, impressive tool overall. Um, and we're seeing uh, Raluca's, yeah, okay, there it is. <laughs> um, so now let's go on to the Q&A um, session. 
I really like one thing you said, Nick, which was about uh, you can pay a meal for a neighbor that you don't even know. And actually, um, I'm Italian and in Italy we have that for coffee. So you can go in a bar and you can pay for a coffee for someone that you don't know. Um, so <laughs> indeed, it's, it's, a, it's a nice initiative. Um, and the, so I wanted to go back to the uh, question of food poverty, as we also have a couple of questions on that in the chat. Um, and one of them is directed to Tom, which is um, how, you know, Maeve Hofer asked um, how the integration of low income groups is going, is working in the, in the Czech CSA. And also we have another more uh, broader question about, um, you know, in terms of improving, um, sorry, now I have some chat message on it. Okay, so, um, well, I don't see the question anymore for some reason. Um, anyway, so more and more generally about food poverty, how is it working in the, in the for Tom? Um, Nick, if you want to elaborate a bit on that, and maybe Raluk as well, I think you mentioned it a bit uh, less, but perhaps um, any thoughts on, on this uh, important topic? Um, Tom first. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, it's, incredibly delicate uh, issue and process. Um, what we, we basically, of course, we are discussing it for a very long time, also on an international level on urgency, uh, which is you know, the overarching organization for CSAs uh, in Europe and worldwide. Um, uh, there are many examples, but in Czech Republic, what we, uh, Basically, it's a very long-term integration process because we are trying to integrate people from completely different reality, uh, economically and culturally uh, often. Uh, and currently we're discussing integration of a uh, single mom with uh, two kids. And uh, the mom, she, you know, she's working two or three jobs and can't afford to pay uh, their daughter's uh, lunch uh, at school. So, uh, but on the other hand, when we discussed the proposition to integrate them in some way, uh, we also found out, and this is one of the key problems, that they don't have time to cook. So what you saw in my presentation, most of it is fresh produce, which is, you know, <laughs> super cool and stuff, but you have to process it somehow. You have to, you know, uh, spend some time cooking it and this is one of the first barriers to uh, 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 yep. Kristen can you echo? turn your uh, uh, okay thank you um, so the cooking part and taking the time to cook is one barrier and second is the you know the the capital or the money barrier and this uh, what we decided to do is to collect uh, finances to pay up for all or part of the uh, of the cost of the produce for for this uh, single mom, but on the other hand, this is very tricky. We don't want to serve as a you know charity or a food bank that we are giving away food. We uh, for us, what's very important is to become part of the community so that they feel ownership of the whole thing, that they feel ownership, that uh, it's their decision at the end of the day. And if they don't decide to participate on this, fair enough. Uh, but uh, I thought this would be a much more uh, easy process, but uh, it's already taking a year, the full year. We are basically contemplating this single case. Uh, I'm talking from the perspective of my CSA, or the CSA where I'm coordinator. And uh, so there are no uh, shortcuts to this, uh, it seems at this point, but uh, I'll be happy to hear some more functional uh, methods from Nick perhaps. <laughs> yes, indeed, Nick, you had also brought this topic up. Would you like to intervene? Thank you. Yes, I completely agree, Tom. Um, we noticed that food poverty has been exacerbated by the pandemic, that, that there was a, a big problem with people not 
being able to afford food pre-pandemic, and that has grown a lot during the during COVID. Um, we have noticed that food banks are they have a role, but in 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 my opinion, it is a role that in some cases perpetuates food poverty, and that I would like to move away from. Uh, food banks. I'd like to move to a, towards a, a, a model that helps people work their way out of, of food poverty and be supported out of that. We do have some food banks within the Open Food Network distributing surplus food, either surplus food coming direct from farms or from or from supermarkets. Um, but what happened during the pandemic was that projects that had previously had a focus on buyers who were buying local food and paying a premium for it and were probably in a sort of a, a, a middle income, higher income socio socioeconomic group um, and, and food banks that were addressing only people in food poverty. The change that happened to Germany has started to really notice the people in their community who were struggling and introducing these ideas of paying it forward and, uh, and paying a little bit extra for their food. Um, Another project that came up was uh, a project within the Open Food Network called Freezers of Love. <laughs> now, the Freezers of Love is a is a community project that takes surplus produce from farms and local uh, local sources. It then makes uh, frozen meals. It puts them in freezers around the community, uh, in 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 church halls, in in um, people's um, back gardens, people's garages, pe places where people can access those freezers. And the, the food is available on a donations basis. Many of the freezers have a microwave beside them. So homeless people can come in and take a frozen meal from the freezer, put it in the microwave and eat it immediately. Um, if they want to, they can make a donation at the point of uh, taking the meal. And people can make a donation without taking a meal. All of that is, is kept um, confidential. So in terms of food dignity, we want it to be possible for people to be able to take food without appearing to ask for charity and to be able to give without appearing to be, you know, to, to, without anyone knowing who's given. So we're trying to build food dignity. We're trying to make food as accessible as possible to the whole community. And, and I believe that if a community can take responsibility for those less fortunate within the community, that is a more resilient model that, than depending on um, national governmental intervention in the form of in the form of food banks. I noticed in the chat that Ben has mentioned uh, growing communities. I don't know if Ben wants to come in on a bit more and talk more about that model, but there are many, many um, interesting models addressing uh, food, food poverty um, ac across across the world. Yeah, thank you, Nick. And uh, Raluca, maybe shortly as well, if you want to intervene on, on food poverty and low income groups. Yeah, I think we don't talk enough, at least um, here in, um, in Romania, we could uh, talk much more about that, well, especially for the very vulnerable groups, children and um, old people. Um, what we have encountered was um, Finally, we took the lead from uh, uh, off from uh, from this discussion during the pandemic when uh, the need became very obvious, and um, <clears throat> I've seen uh, people uh, mobilizing, making shoppings for each other. Um, the food bank came uh, arrived right on time in Brasov. Uh, they are redistributing products, but mainly from supermarkets. Uh, which is a little bit, I mean, it's good, but not enough and not um, uh, uh, addressing all the needs. Um, um, the chefs also offered the hot meals during the pandemic, for instance, and I hope um, <clears throat> we will go back to, to this kind of habit much more once that they, maybe they will um, um, overcome uh, the, the challenging times. Um, and um, uh, cooperative, uh, they are um, uh, part of the clients, the families, uh, the clients that uh, the consumers that they have, uh, they are among uh, old people as well, who um, are in need of certain products, who uh, they are suffering of certain uh, illnesses and affections, and they absolutely need, for instance, organic uh, products. Um, they deliver them at home. Um, and uh, they deliver them uh, sometimes um, at uh, much uh, reduced um, uh, prices. 
Um, unfortunately, we don't have a scheme for poverty, uh, for, for groups uh, under poverty, and I think uh, there is much more that we should discuss so here. It's very much regarded as being in the hands or under the responsibility of the government or the institutions. But with the pandemic, um, I've noticed um, initiatives at the neighborhood level, uh, you know, and among neighbors where we, they started to, to help and support each other. And I support what Nick and Tom also mentioned that I think we need to grow a bottom up uh, approach rather than waiting for uh, an institutional intervention uh, uh, to take place. Yes, thanks, Raluca. Um, indeed, a very important topic, but quite difficult to, you know, some expect that the government should do it, as you say. So, um, you know, any work, any work on that is, is absolutely welcome, of course. Um, I'd now like to go to a bit more of a, of a practical question. Um, and it's about what is exactly local food in terms of distance. Um, and for instance, this is also quite an interesting topic when you speak about public procurement, as procurers often have to um, you know, there's a whole debate about what is local food, how can you procure locally, and so on. So, um, Carolina Rodriguez is asking um, when, you know, each of you refers to local food and short supply, short, short supply chains, what is the distance actually for short? Um, and she adds that her veg box provide, providers deliver local food, but for them local means Europe. And so she receives also uh, produce from France that is then delivered to the UK. Um, I mean, perhaps Tom again, and, and we take the same order. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm just trying to measure the distance between uh, us and our farmers. It's, uh, I'll tell you right away, um, just to, yeah, so, Basically, yeah, 80, 82 kilometers. Okay, so that is indeed quite quite local. <laughs> yeah, 80, so it's uh, it's out of uh, outside of Prague, uh, 80 kilometers away from Prague, and I mean, look, Czech Republic is a very small country. It's uh, you know uh, to consider local something is basically you know, 100 kilometers here, 100 kilometers there. But uh, I think it's about what makes sense in terms of time, the delivery, uh, so that they don't spend uh, as much, uh, you know, time sitting in the car, I mean, the farmers or whoever brings the food to us. And so that also we uh, don't, uh, uh, the carbon footprint, which don't we don't really calculate as such, but of course it's higher. Uh, and uh, the local, uh, I or we in the Czech CSA, we really don't frame the locality as a nationalistic uh, aspect that it, it ends with Czech borders. Uh, not at all. Uh, there are some cooperations with uh, with Austria, for example on the border of Austria or border of Poland. So uh, this makes sense to us. And I think it's more about the type of food that they are uh, growing, that it's, uh, that's, it's suitable for the local climate and, uh, and the local you know, conditions and the soil, the type of soil that they, they're using. And uh, I think this connection, and uh, we are actually with one of the members of uh, the CSA, we would like to do a research on the effects of uh, microbiome, the soil microbiome in our farmer's soil, how it affects our gut microbiome uh, of us as a consumers. So we will be looking at links between, you know, organic soil and the health of our gut bacteria of us as a CSA consumers. Uh, I will keep you <laughs> informed about the results of this, uh, but uh, locality for us uh, is, a, is a, you know, very wide concept. And I think it could be, um, I think uh, whatever makes sense to anybody, you can, you can uh, make any points why locality is uh, Europe or, uh, or Czech Republic. Uh, but I have to add one, uh, another 
option, let's say, or perspective, uh, our colleagues started uh, a project which focuses uh, uh, specifically on uh, citrus and uh, you know fruits and vegetables, which we can't grow in Czech Republic because of the climate. So there is a solidarity partnership with Greek producers, uh, Greek agroecology producers, and uh, we pay you know fair wage to them, etc. It's uh, organically certified, and um, this is you know for me the, the pomegranate or orange that I get from this system. I consider being local or short distribution chains because there are no intermediaries, and uh, it's the closest I could get to an orange, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, my points to this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tom. Indeed, it looks like for you, the, you know, local is really, really local. Um, what about for you, Nick? Is it still, you know, 80 kilometers range or a bit more? This, yeah, the interesting question. This varies from food hub to food hub. Um, the food hub that I'm part of, we, we started off deciding that we wanted a 15 mile, so that's a 20 kilometer uh, radius, that we would not sell any food more than 20 kilometers from our town. Um, and we stuck to that for the first year or two, but then several people to us i really want to support the food hub i want to buy local food but my children must have bananas and if i'm if i'm going to go to a supermarket to buy bananas i might as well buy all my other produce there we decided that we were going to relax our principles we were going to aim to have the majority of our produce within 15 miles but we would be buying in um bananas and other and other produce because we wanted to, to provide people with a, a full shopping basket um each Food Hub will make its own decisions on this. Uh, what we're aiming to do is to, to focus the, the, the uh, growing of as much produce as possible within the Food Hub area, within the catchment area. Um, but we also want to make it economically viable. And, and we do need to have a, a, a big range of shoppers and buyers supporting the Hub to make it financially viable. One of the principles of the Open Food Network is subsidiarity, which, which means that decisions must be made at the most locally level, local level possible. Um, Nick, you... So, okay. Cool. I think, Nick, Sorry. I think you were having a bit of a technical problem for your last, like, 20 seconds. Ah, uh, sorry. Apologies. Um, I was... Can you hear me okay now? Is, no, this, is this clear? Okay, apologies. Uh, so the principle of subsidiarity is about this has been made at the most local level possible. And if a food hub wants to set a very tight ge a geographical limit, then of course they have every option to do that within, within the, the Open Food Network platform. Um, and it is a difficult decision um, in terms of making um, an enterprise economically viable. How tight do you make that? How tight do you make that? Yeah, uh, great. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, Raluca, you, do you have any thoughts on on this? You know, local. Uh, you know, distance of local and short supply chains. Yes, we have defined that for the sake of the short supply chain measure, <clears throat> and um, it was set for seventy five kilometers. Actually, uh, so the how short is short. Um, we also measured because um, um, the way that the, uh, the country is structured is uh, the, uh, made up by uh, 40 counties. So more or less there are 40 urban centers that we look at. And when we started to measure the distances um, relative to these urban centers, it's, it, it turns out that actually they are about 90, uh, more or less 90 kilometers. But um, the, 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 the let's say the convention that uh, it was made for the for the um, uh, measure funded uh, through the rural development funds it was uh, set at seventy five uh, kilometers. Also, uh, what is short supply uh, chain? It's made up. Uh, we have a definition. It's made up by producers, consumer, and with maximum one intermediator. That's why I was also mentioning that it's very important to clarify what is the role of this intermediator. <clears throat> and um, in terms of uh, food hubs, uh, we don't have one uh, yet in, uh, in Brasov, but we visited the, the one in the nearby uh, county. 
Um, just as uh, Tom and Nick mentioned, it's also very important what the area is, uh, the production potential of the area is. Um, and for instance, uh, the Food Hub was uh, mentioning that they are struggling a little bit to sell products from the area because people are uh, connected to what I mentioned um, um, about the informal networks. They know somebody, they have somebody in the countryside who uh, can source them with some, uh, some of such products. So people, when they go to the city, sometimes they are looking for more um, sophisticated uh, products or products coming from elsewhere. Um, I think this is the ongoing education that we need to talk on and on when it comes about uh, um, uh, acceptance and understanding of uh, local products among consumers. Uh, but uh, they are also looking for uh, artisanal uh, uh, local products. Um, uh, when it comes about uh, food hubs, there are different, there are different uh, examples and different cases, uh, more successful or less successful in, in Romania. But we do have a so-called definition of uh, local. It's 75 kilometers wide and um, a definition of the short supply chain. Maximum one intermediator would be good to every time to mention what is the role of that intermediator. And um, we are still experimenting with some food hubs which are competing greatly with supermarkets at, uh, in the region. Yes, thank you, Raluca. And I see this question has raised quite some interest in the chat as well. Um, some saying that is not, you know, really per se about distance, it's rather about values and, you know, am I buying something that is um, sustainable or not? Uh, also saying that, you know, 80 kilometers on, um, in a mountain are different compared to 80 kilometers uh, in a flat area. So clearly a, a very interesting um, debate. I would like to now move on to uh, other questions that we have in the Q&A. And I think this one is mainly for you, Nick. Um, how does open source food assist with the management of agricultural inputs for farmers and what participation do consumers have in the process? Okay, can I clarify what the question, what the, the person asked the question, what they mean by agricultural inputs? Are, are they talking about um, in terms of fertilizers and um, seed? I, I, that's what that. I would gather. It's um, an anonymous question, so I'm not sure, but that's, yeah. that's how I would read it as well. Okay, the, the Open Food Network does not have a, a role at that side of, of the agriculture. The, the Open Food Network is about taking produce from the farm uh, out to the people who are, who are eating and buying that food. Um, we don't, as such, have any any uh, involvement in the in the uh, inputs to agriculture. In terms of the the consumers, everybody who uses the open network has a role in influencing the the direction of the platform. Um, that includes the the farmers and the growers who are, who are using it to sell through the platform, and it also includes the hubs and the the shop fronts and the people who are buying um, buying that food through the platform. We have several ways of doing that. We have a signal group, we have a, um, a discourse channel, we have a, a website where anybody can, can make comments. Uh, openfood.org.uk is the, is the UK site. Each of the countries um, in, in the global community has its own website and people in those countries can make comments on the, the way the platform is evolving. They can encourage us to look at, uh, a recent example was in Italy where we were encouraged to link up with the slow food movement. We, we are now building um, a, a, an integration between the Open Food Network and, and the slow food movement. So it is very much a, a, a community led, a bit like community supported agriculture, it's community supported software, where the people who are using the software decide um, how, it, how it evolves in the future. I hope that addresses. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Nick. Um, that was really interesting. So I'd like to also ask a question it was directed to, to only Unic, but I think um, it can be interesting for all of you uh, to reply to. And it's about us, it's about the digital readiness of uh, producers. So if you could reflect a bit on the digital readiness of small producers and processors, and actually I will also ask Raluca to sort of develop upon that because I was really um, interested in what you were saying about, you know, professionalizing. Um, for the producers work. So how did you do that? You know, how, how do you tell them, you know, you have to go to the bank and do that and that. So I was really interested um, to hear more 
you know about the specific question for Raluca and then to all of you know more about the digital digitalization of producers. So perhaps Raluca, would you like to, to start? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, they are very curious, the producers, uh, first of all, how they can uh, integrate uh, technology over the farm. Um, and that is uh, um, triggered by a real, <laughs> very practical need. Uh, labor is becoming very short. So um, they are, um, I think, uh, thinking very much uh, in terms of what can be transformed and what can be uh, replaced with technology um, uh, only when they are uh, constrained by certain needs. So they are already talking about how they could uh, control, for instance, irrigation and temperature and what kind of devices they could connect to their uh, phones, for instance, um, in terms of um, controlling and monitoring the production. This is uh, uh, one of the most uh, um, obvious need that they have. Um, um, we are missing a little bit the, the proper advices, let's say, the, uh, in this uh, in this field. How to who are these um, um, technology new technologies people that could assist the farmers? Um, in some cases, are in some they are not. When it was necessary to connect better with the consumers in the free market, in uh, 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 the presentation I was mentioning about that, um, they realized that uh, consumers during the pandemic became very uh, used to pay by card. In the free market, you are normally going uh, with cash, or at least the producers were used to to, um, to be paid uh, ca in cash. Uh, there were a couple of uh, moments at the beginning when. Uh, um, it was this, uh, yeah, I don't have cash, I have only the card, so uh, we immediately contacted the, the bank and um, uh, communicated this, uh, this need of uh, coming uh, with a solution quickly. Uh, and we succeeded to turn in just one week a, a, a phone into a device for paying by card uh, in the free market uh, by consumers. So um, they immediately were taken, the producers were very taken with a, a quick uh, solution to, to such a need. Uh, they, they are uh, now thinking what else they could use their phones uh, in terms of uh, learning uh, about um, uh, production on, uh, beyond the social uh, media for, for staying connected with the uh, consumers and with their clients. But I think it's much more that we can explore. Um, as I said, even starting with these very concrete needs uh, and the first and re very real need is uh, lack of uh, increased lack of uh, labor um, that they are encountering on, uh, on the farm. Um, they don't have time to attend trainings and, you know, in lengthy <laughs> um, courses and so on. So I think we should uh, start thinking uh, how one device can serve for multiple purposes uh, the farmers. Um, their need is uh, for, for such thing is there, but also how we can guide them and which would be the best advisors to, to support them in, in, uh, in this respect. Yes, thank you, Raluca. Really interesting to hear, you know, really how it's going on in the ground and also to, you know, hear these differences of cash and, and card. It seems, uh, you know, simple, but it, it is clearly a, a barrier. Um, Tom, would you like to provide your, your thoughts on this uh, shortly? Yes, uh, actually very interesting question because to be perfectly honest, I don't remember ever discussing uh, the topic of digitalization or anything IT or whatever uh, included in this with our farmers or in this CSA community in Czech Republic. Uh, we never ever discussed this, uh, meaning there is no need uh, for this, our farmers, uh, I think most of them don't have uh, smartphones and yet uh, most of them don't even use a uh, PC. Uh, well, occasionally uh, there we have a problem to uh, even share, for example, a, you know, uh, like uh, orders with them. So it, it is problem time to time, but uh, nothing that can't be solved with a, a short call. And, but what is interesting that uh, digitalization is a big topic on a higher level in terms of organic agriculture in bigger farms producing grains. So that's precision farming. Uh, it's 
one of the you know first uh areas that they are entering uh you know and specifically this year was very fruitful in terms of uh you know integrating precision farming into organic agriculture but not necessarily uh with small scale farmers uh fruit or vegetable farmers so that's my short answer thank you so clearly a different reality but that's also um great to see uh, Nick, would you like to, in two minutes, <laughs> give your thoughts on this topic? Yep, I'll keep it really brief. In my experience, farmers and growers are good at producing food. They're not necessarily good at using computers. Um, so a lot of our food hubs will find that they need to phone up their producers every week and check what products they've got available, what price they want to change, if there's any new products to be added. In doing this extra, make a higher markup on the on the on the selling price, and this covers their time in managing the enterprise on behalf of the producer. We shouldn't have support them, and the and the provide tool that can be that can allow other people to to do that admin work on behalf of the important people who are growing the food. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, so I'd say that, you know, we've we've really looked at three different um, ways of making short supply chains work in three different um, countries, three different settings, uh, three different distances, as we've also uh, found out. Um, and we have also seen really the role that citizens can play in this um, in you know transitioning towards sustainable more sustainable food systems and specifically um, buying local foods uh, supporting um, short supply chains um, and so on i was also very pleased that we could then speak about you know also other important topics such as um, food poverty such as digitalization such as also briefly about public procurement um, so I, I hope that you all found this webinar as interesting and as uh, thought provoking as I found it. Um, and with that, I would also really much like to thank the speakers. Uh, it was really great interventions to also thank all of you in the chat for making it very lively for all the questions you've asked. Um, and with that, I will leave you to a short video of uh, Food Shift. And uh, thank you to, to all of you, also the interpreters who did, I hope, a very great job. Thank you. Foodshift 2030 is an EU Horizon 2020 project, which is running over four years and is involving 31 partners from in total 12 countries. The objectives of Foodshift 2030 is to transform the European food system towards a low carbon circular future, including a shift to less meat and more plant-based diets. The cities uh, which are involved are Athens, um, Avignon, Barcelona, Brazov, Berlin, Bari, Copenhagen, Ostend and Wroclaw. We will be working on strengthening the local food system and making the eaters and local producers closer and in cooperation. We're focused on building open source technology for urban agriculture. We're establishing a food life center, which is a sort of food hub or food campus in the former Tempelhof Airport building in Berlin. We build on the method developed by Copenhagen House of Food try to educate the kitchens to demand more locally sourced produce. We are expanding the agricultural park in Ostende. Involving youth entrepreneurs uh, to recover abandoned land. Nous avons besoin de construire une nouvelle cuisine centrale afin de poursuivre notre mission de service public en servant une alimentation plus respectueuse de l'environnement biologique et local. The goal is to reconnect youngsters with the land and make them appreciate and the value their food again. Integration of the small producers from Russia area uh, into short supply chains, uh, develop the sustainability of short supply chains and the better connection with the consumers in, uh, in urban areas and rural areas. We expect to be able to use Foodshift 2030 as an example 
of how cities can be hubs of innovation, successful hubs of innovation where food is the driver. As a citizen-driven project, we are very interested to have as many as possible people on board to help us uh, forming the new food system of the future. We want to engage the SMEs, the, the NGOs, the local authorities, uh, the researchers and the citizens in each of the city regions. The citizens from the local communities will be invited to join our Food Shift Accelerator Labs, where we are working to develop uh, the citizen-driven food system solutions. That's why we count on them, count on you, to bring the change uh, in our food system that Food 2030 is imminent.